question, uh, but we miss you. Hope you'll be able to tune in to our lesson at uh, some point. What about your Bibles? I need to see your Bibles tonight. Can I do that? All right, get them up high. Good, good, good. I like to see the Bibles. And we're going to be turning to some pages tonight in the Bible. Now, those of you using your phone, of course, can't do that. And so I can't hear rustling pages from you, including some like, well, anyway. Anyhow, um, now, I don't know if this lesson, wait, did I turn this on? I doubt it. It's on now. Doesn't sound any different. You guys got it back there? Good deal. Don't we have some good men working back there and women? So we appreciate that very much. I don't know if this lesson is um, more preachy or teachy. Alan, you know the difference. And so uh, I'll let you decide. Uh, I think it's going to be more along the lines of more teachy than a sermon. It's certainly not going to be a hellfire and brimstone sermon. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm delighted to share some lessons with you. I have four lessons, and <clears throat> we had hoped that they could be all in a row, but I have an engagement next Sunday night at Bivy Branch in McMinnville. Uh, for many, many years, the congregations asked me to speak there in the summer on their Sunday night series. And so I'll be there next Sunday night. But then after that, we'll do three more lessons in a row uh, on the question of the elders and the deacons. So here's the plan. Tonight, we're going to talk about the duties of elders and the duties of members. And then week after next, we're going to talk about the negative qualifications that an elder must meet to serve. And then the next Sunday night, we're going to talk about the positive qualifications that an elder must have in order to be an elder. And then the next Sunday night, we're going to talk about the work and the qualifications of deacons. At some point, I would like to do another lesson on handling church conflict, and maybe we can work that in with the elders' uh, permission on some uh, Sunday night. But at any rate, at this point, we have four lessons uh, that we're going to be looking at. Now, <clears throat> in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament, God's people have frequently been described as sheep. For example, in 2 Chronicles 18 and 16, they're spoken of as sheep without a shepherd. Matthew 9, 36, Mark 6, 34, they are sheep without a shepherd. I find it interesting that the Lord pictures His people as sheep. I've talked to some people who have, have raised sheep, and I've said, are they really that dumb? And he said, they're dumb. Now, I don't know much about you know, sheep myself. I said, do they really require, you know, a leader? Yep, they need a leader, you know, also. And so that helps us understand such passages as Psalm 23 and, and so on. But at any rate, um, the Lord knew that His people as sheep would need shepherds to lead them. He knew that His people as sheep would need shepherds to lead them. And so to that end, God intended for local congregations to be scripturally organized, to have elders uh, in place, and also to have deacons and evangelists in place uh, as well. And so in Acts chapter 14 and 23, when Paul came to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, he appointed elders in every city. He told Titus in Titus 1 and verse 5, appoint elders in every city. And so the Lord planned it this way, and we want to go by you know, His plan. Now, when we find um, elders in the church, we always find them um, in a plurality. For example, in Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul salutes the bishops and the deacons. Not the bishop, but the bishops and the deacons. And then in Acts 20 and 17, Paul called for the Ephesian elders uh, in the plural. And so there's no such thing as a single elder you know, serving in a congregation. Now, in, a term, in addition to the term elder, <clears throat> there are other terms that might um, be equally used. For example, pastor. We have five elders here, but we could call them five pastors. I mean, that would be scriptural. That's a scriptural term. We could call them five shepherds. 
We could call them the five overseers. All of that would be scriptural. We could call them the five bishops. All of those are scriptural terms. But we have agreed to use the word elders, and it's a good choice. We, when the word elder is used, it um, typically signifies someone who has some age uh, on their part. Um, for example, um, in John 8 and verse 9, the same word used for elder is used there where it says that they left from the oldest to the youngest. From the oldest to the youngest. So see, that's pointing to some men, you know, of age. In Acts 2 and 17, uh, in Joel's prophecy that Alan talked about recently in his sermon, uh, there you have the elders will dream dreams, the young men shall see visions. So you have a contrast between, you know, the older men and the younger men. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, when elder is used, it is typically referring, you know, to some men who, you know, have, you know, some age about them and some degree, you know, of experience in life. Okay, so let's see what we can do uh, this evening. You ready? All right, this slide has to do with the duties of elders. And <clears throat> their duties are these. Number one, take heed to themselves. I've got here, take heed to yourselves, but when I speak, I'll say themselves. So they should take heed to themselves. And, and doing what? Uh, by the way, this is Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, when Paul addressed the Ephesian elders. He said, take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you overseers to feed the church of God, which he's purchased with his own blood. So <clears throat> we find here, first of all, that Paul says, take heed to yourselves. And the, the uh, tense of the verb here, you know, could easily be translated like this. Keep on taking heed to yourselves. So it's not something that an elder is to do and then it's over with. He is to continually um, to take heed, you know, to himself. Well, take heed to what? <clears throat> First of all, that their lives conform to the will of God. Elders have to do that. You know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, for us to examine ourselves, <clears throat> whether we be in the faith. So elders have to examine themselves and make sure that their lives conform to God's will. You know, the Bible says in Acts 1 and 1, in <clears throat> Luke's words, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach. So elders need to take heed that they're doing the doing before they're doing the teaching. The doing comes uh, before uh, the teaching. Elders need to keep on taking heed <clears throat> that they know the good book. Amen? Amen. All right. Y'all are getting a little better on that. They need to know the book. You know, the Bible says that we're to lay aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. And as newborn babes do what? Desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. Y'all forgive me. I <clears throat> felt this coming on. And let me just say, it's coming, okay? <clears throat> and um, uh, hopefully I can make it through the lesson. Um, I've, I've got a cough drop here. I don't know where this came from. Whose is this? <laughs> well, it's, it's mine now, unless you want it back. Oh, Brian's coming to get me or something. No, oh, I got me some water, Brian. Yeah, but thank you for your... Uh, you know, it always makes me nervous when the elder starts walking down. <laughs> You know, it kind of reminds me of that story I heard one time. You know, an old experienced preacher, Brother Allen, was preaching. And he, he said to the audience, the best years of my life were spent in the arms of another man's wife. And everybody's kind of, you know, up on the edge and everything. Thank you. And, <clears throat> and then he said, my beloved mother. Well, there was a young preacher there. And... He heard that preacher say that, and he thought, man, I got to use that in one of my sermons. You know it, don't you, Alan? And so he gets to his home congregation, and he says, the best years of my life were spent in the arms of another man's wife. And about that time, Brian came down, and then another elder came down, and another elder came down. Brother Jonathan would come down. And it got the young man so shook up, he got rattled, and he said, 
And for the life of me, I can't remember who it was. <laughs> so every time I'm preaching and I see somebody coming down the aisle like that, it makes me think about that. Sorry, nothing to do with the sermon. Okay. All right. They need to make sure they know the good book. I'm going to leave out a lot of these verses because of my situation that apparently is coming on. But we should desire the milk of the word, right? We are to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. The Hebrews writer wrote uh, the Hebrews and said, For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one should teach you again, which be the first principles of God. And have become such as have need of milk and not of solid food. For everyone who uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. Solid food belongs to those who are of full age, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. We expect elders to be of full age. We expect elders to know the book. They got to know the book. And so it, that's going to relate to one of the qualifications, namely not a novice, but we'll talk about that you know, later on. We need to be sure that elders um, take heed to themselves that they have a pure character. One of my favorite verses, and I would encourage you to memorize this one, Philippians 4, 8. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are are uh, pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think about these things. And so all of us as Christians must be pure, but how much more so those in leadership positions, right? They must take heed to themselves that they keep themselves pure. You may not be what you think you are, but you are what you think, Proverbs chapter 23 and verse number uh, seven. Furthermore, elders should take heed to themselves that they are examples to the flock. Uh, turn to the book of Hebrews in chapter 13 in verse number seven. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Now notice that it says here that the people were to follow the faith of the elders. Well, that says to me that they've got to be good examples, you know, to the flock. Because the writer here is encouraging them, you know, to follow the example uh, of the elders. In John chapter 10, you know, this chapter where Jesus claims to be the good shepherd, he says, um, this is about verses 3 and following somewhere in there. He says that the sheep hear his voice and they follow him. When he walks out, they follow him. I think y'all just had a little experiment in that, didn't you, Alan, in your recent activity? <clears throat> I'm telling you the truth, right? They follow the shepherd. And so elders have got to be people uh, that people will be willing uh, to follow. So in what areas should they be good examples? They ought to be good examples in the area of liberality. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Listen to me. There is no room in the Lord's church for a stingy elder. No room. None of us are supposed to be stingy to start with. But especially, you know, in the eldership. No room for a stingy elder. They need to be good examples in dedication. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. And don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So elders have got to be people like all of us who present our bodies as living sacrifices and and people who do not conform to the world. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when Paul told the brethren there to discipline the uh, man who was living with his father's wife, you remember that, don't you? And you, uh, you know, he told them not to keep company with fornicators. And he said, not altogether the fornicators of the world, otherwise we'd have to leave the world. <laughs> okay? Uh, and so my point is this. We are in the world. We have to, at times, work with worldly people 
we're around worldly things, but we live above it, don't we? We live above the world and the way the world uh, is. Elders need to be good examples in uh, optimism and enthusiasm. Optimism and enthusiasm. Um, men, I think I've shaken hands with all of y'all, and you got good handshakes. God help us to never have a handshake that's like a fish. That's just not going to do. We, we can't have that. I'm thinking of a person right now. When you shake his hand, you walk up to him, and it's almost like it's something on display. You know, he just puts it out like that. And I'm saying, what's your problem, brother? And, well, we're just going to shake hands. I said, I'm not shaking a hand. looks like that. I said, if we're going to shake hands, let's get her up in there tight, right? And don't do like me and hurt someone who has arthritis. But, you know, you're going to have a smile on your face, you know, a good, firm handshake, and you're going to be an optimistic person, right? You want to you remember the story in Numbers, you know, chapter 13. You know, when the spies came back, you remember the report they gave? Boys, we saw it. And I mean, it was an incredible land. And then they said, look at this cluster of grapes over here. It took two guys, two guys to carry this out of the land. We hadn't seen anything like that in any Kroger store or anywhere. And then they said, but, there comes that word, but. We saw the giants and they looked, and they looked at us like we were grasshoppers. And we looked at ourselves and we thought, well, we're grasshoppers ourselves. We cannot take the land. We got to have elders that are like men like Caleb. Stood up, verse number 30, and said, boys, let's go get them. We're well able to do it. See, he had faith in God. He put his faith in God. In many, in many elder meetings I have, I have been in, you know, where I was trying to help a struggling congregation you know, get backsliders back or whatever, you know, even um, and, and present a plan and so forth. And then to have that one man throw cold water on the whole deal, which destroys, you know, the whole thrust, you know, of the meeting. Can't have that. We got to have men of optimism. And uh, we, we don't want, you know, a lot of pessimism, you know, being, being uh, shared. Now, let's look at some negative aspects. Um, they should take heed to the flock that they um, shepherd the flock. No, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself when I said negative aspects. They need to take heed to the flock that they shepherd the flock. See, we've been talking about them taking heed to themselves. But what about the flock? Well, in the first place, they've got to shepherd the flock. Uh, I've heard of a book one time, I've not read it, but that elders are shepherds who smell like sheep. I do like the idea there. The shepherds are supposed to smell like the sheep. What does that tell you? You know what it says. The shepherds are with the sheep. They're around the sheep. They're encouraging the sheep. They're exhorting, you know, the sheep. To feed the flock is found in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed to yourselves and all the flock. To feed the flock. Some translations have shepherd the flock. And it's also found in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2. Uh, feed the flock of God which is among you. And so that's one of the duties of, of an elder. is to feed, feed the flock. Uh, the word is defined as watching out you know, for other people. To shepherd. It describes a person who protects, who rules, and who governs, and who fosters. I'm think, I can't help but think of Ezekiel chapter 34 uh, when I, I think of this. Because in Ezekiel 34, uh, the writer talks about the bad shepherds. And in verse 2 it says of 34, Son of man prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. I'm telling you, brethren, this is a very, very serious thing uh, that the elder has a responsibility to do, namely to feed the flock. 
Uh, what does that entail? It means to provide adequate food for them. Um, some of you may raise cattle. Uh, you got to provide adequate food for them. Is that right? I mean, you, you can't be skimpy on the food and expect to have a good outcome, right? And so, in a similar fashion, uh, just as a farmer would provide good pasturage, you know, for his animals, then the elders need to provide good pasturage, as it were, you know, for the sheep. So that means that they need to be sure that the uh, curriculum is what it needs to be, that there's some milk of the word being taught, you know, sometimes, but there's meat of the word, you know, being taught, you know, sometimes. And so they want to be sure that the flock, you know, has, has a good diet. We're all interested in living by a good diet, aren't we? Or at least we're supposed to be. I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at it, but I'm getting better. Okay, but anyway... Uh, the shepherds have got to make sure that they have that, that we, that's us, have a good diet. And the shepherds must be sure, you know, of the teaching, you know, by the teachers of the sheep. So that means they need to make sure that what comes out of this pulpit is according to the book. Is that right? They need to make sure that what comes out of the classrooms is according to the book. We want to go by the book. In the areas of judgment, we have some liberty there. But in matters of faith, <coughs> we, we, cannot, we cannot stray and just do whatever you know, we would like uh, to do. Uh, the elders in tending the flock and seeing that they get food uh, themselves must be able to teach. And we'll talk more about that in one of the qualifications. <coughs> I'm not saying that they must do all the teaching. They're overseers, and we've not gotten to that point yet, but an overseer is to see you know, that things are taken, you know, care of. Good shepherds uh, must be able by sound doctrine to exhort and to convict those who contradict Titus chapter 1 verse 9. So see that, don't you see what I'm saying? That entails knowing the book. So see, you know the book. And so when you hear something that's not sound, see, you're able, you know, to take that person and to, you know, help that person, hopefully, as Priscilla and Aquila did, Apollos, you know, see the way of the Lord, you know, more perfectly. Um, the shepherds are to watch for the flock. In Acts chapter 20, after Paul says, take heed to yourselves and to the flock, he says, beginning in verse number 29, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves uh, shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, you know, I've warned you night and days, you know, with tears. And so Paul told the Ephesian elders, you know, get ready. If you're going to take care of this flock, you've got to watch for danger, you know, that might come uh, to the flock. Uh, another thing we ought to say here, I, I think on this point, is uh, sh the shepherds of this congregation have the responsibility to shepherd the sheep of this congregation. They don't have authority over some other congregation. You know, they have authority here in the area of judgment. And so as they feed the flock, they're not, you know, trying to dictate, you know, for other congregations because it's their job to take care of the sheep, you know, who are are here. Okay, another thing about the elders is they should take heed to the flock that they oversee it. They oversee it. They are called overseers. The word episkopos is the Greek word. It's rendered bishop in some places, like Acts 20 and 28. Um, it's, uh, or rather, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, and Philippians chapter 1. And verse 1, it's translated overseer in Acts 20 and verse 28. But the word can be translated bishop. Now, it's not a bishop in the sense that you know in some other religions, you know, where there's this one archbishop. That's not at all what the Bible's talking about here. The Bible's talking about this same person who is also described as an elder, who is also described as a shepherd. Everybody with me on that? Okay. All right. So what does an overseer do? An overseer is someone who sees 
that the things that are done are done rightly. They might, may not do all of it, but they're going to see that it's done you know, correctly, done rightly. This involves the idea of ruling, obviously. You know, Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey those who have the rule you know, over you and submit yourselves. We're going to talk more about that in just, just a minute. So elders have authority in matters of judgment. What do you mean by that, Brother David? Well, what I mean is this. <coughs> no elder has the right to tell me or any other preacher that we can't preach on certain biblical subjects. Isn't that right, Alan? I know a man. He told me his elders forbade him saying anything about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And I told that brother, I said, I get my orders from somebody higher than the elders on that. I get it from the good book. And that came from the Holy Ghost. Right? Who is one of the members of the Godhead, of course. So where, does, where do elders have their authority? They have it in the area of judgment. Now, it's their responsibility to make sure nobody's going to be rolling a piano down the aisle. Of course. But let me use this illustration. Let's say the church is looking for a preacher, okay? And so you have Preacher X comes and, as we say, tries out, which I hate that language. But anyway, and then Preacher Y comes and tries out. And 90% uh, and of the congregation wants Preacher X, but the elders said, no, we don't like him. We're going to get Preacher Y. That just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. You know, really. You, you see, good judgment to me would... And if you're going to have sheep to follow you, if you expect them to follow, I mean, you can't be a leader if people are not willing to follow. If you expect them to follow, you would maybe make a different uh, judgment there. Uh, 1 Peter 5 and 2 says, uh, you serve as overseers. I think we need to remember that. An overseer is a servant. All right, here's some negative aspects. Um, <clears throat> Peter says, not by constraint, the King James has. New King James has not by compulsion. And so an elder should not undertake his duties out of the whole idea that he has to do it, okay? You know, the Bible says, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good thing. If he, if he does, some people say, and I'll say more about that in qualifications, that he must desire the office. But the verse says, if a man does desire the office, he desires a good thing. But elders, you know, should be people, you know, who don't serve out of compulsion. They desire to do what they're doing. They do not serve out of dishonest gain. Apparently, <clears throat> at least in the early church, there were some elders who were supported financially by the congregation. Well, where do you get that, Brother David? Well, in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17, it says... Uh, that there are some who labor among you who are worthy of double honor. If you look up the word honor in the Greek, you will find by definition it, it uh, means honor conferred through compensation, an honorarium. And so that idea of honor is more than just paying respect. And so there's nothing unscriptural with the congregation um, having a paid elder. You know, just like you have, you know, Brother Allen is supported by this congregation here. And, and I'm supported by the congregation. And um, you support missionaries and so forth. You could have an elder that's supported. I used to work at a congregation in the 70s that had a man on the payroll. And he did a lot of uh, maintenance and, and um, so forth to the building. But he did also a whole lot, you know, of things relative to, you know, working with, uh, with the sheep. And another thing about the elders is they should not oversee as being lords over God's heritage. Peter says it this way, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not as lords over God's heritage. Well, what does that mean, uh, David? Well, they're not watchdogs. They are not uh, watchdogs especially of the treasury I've worked with some elders that kind of viewed themselves, you know, that way. The elders should be concerned about getting the viewpoint, you know, of the congregation. They're not little popes. They're not little tyrants, you know, over the church. 
They're not men who say, we're going to have our way. We don't care what the congregation thinks. That is not uh, suitable in, in an eldership. An eldership should learn the desires of the congregation, you know, weigh those desires and so forth against what? The good what? The good what? Book. And so it's not majority rule. It's not preacher rule. It's the elders, you know, decision as they weigh it according, you know, to the good book. All right. We already talked a little bit about watching the flock. I think we've got that point. So um, I'm just going to go on because of time to the duties of members. Okay. I've got four verses. I'm going to go ahead and bring them up here. These are the verses that I found. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 7. Remember the elders. I looked that up in this uh, one of the most respected lexicons, Bayer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich. And they define it as keep them in mind. Think of them. So do you do that, brethren? When you're driving down the road, do you think about our elders? Are you keeping them in mind? Are you thinking about the struggles that they have? Are you thinking about the challenges you know, that they face in dealing with you know, a congregation of this size? We need to be remembering them. Furthermore, we should imitate their faith. <clears throat> We've already said something about that. And Hebrews 13, 17, obey those who have the rule over you. And so we're supposed to be obedient to our elders. I was talking to a preacher friend about this one time, and he was just having a real hard time with that. And I said, listen, it's like this. If you cannot be submissive to the elders, then you need to go pack your suitcase. Well, they this and they that. And I said, look, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And the Bible says you're supposed to be submissive, you know, to the elders. And if you can't do that here, then you need, um, you know, to put your walking shoes on and go somewhere else. That's just the truth of it. Is that right, Al? All right. Furthermore, um, I already mentioned something about submit to them, to submit to them. Um, what does that mean to submit uh, to uh, the elders? Well, in 1 Peter chapter 5, Paul says that the younger people should submit to the elders. But I think there he's talking about that older man. I'm sorry, I think there he's talking about an elder. But rather, in 1 Timothy 5 in verse 1, Paul says, rebuke not an elder. You've all read that passage, haven't you? But what is the context? The context has to do with older men, younger men, you know, different age groups, okay? So in 1 Timothy 5 and 1, the same word is used, but the context dictates that it's not referring to a shepherd of the flock. But it is being referred to in 1 Peter 5 and 5, I think, because Peter, you know, begins that context by saying, you know, feed the flock of God which is among you taking the oversight, you know, thereof. So, and that's not the only verse that we could, you know, look at. In Hebrews 13 and 17, obey those who have the rule over you and be submissive. Be submissive, you know, to them. Submit to the elders. What does that mean? To recognize them, to respect them, to respect their uh, decisions. And... If you think about it, it's kind of it's like this. The uh, as members, not every one of us are going to agree with every decision that the elders make. I'm saying in all likelihood that's the case. But if they're making decisions in matters of judgment, then we have to if we are going to put ourselves under their oversight, then we must submit, you know, to their decision. Even, you know, even if we don't particularly like that judgment. Uh, and then we should not leave the building and say, well, those knuckleheads didn't agree with me. You know, I gave them a suggestion and so forth, and, and they just did something that I didn't like, and blah, blah, blah. That's not right. When we leave the building, we got to be people, you know, who support the decision, you know, of the elders. Just, and similarly, in an elders' meeting. <coughs> in an elders' meeting, um, Let's say we have five elders here. Let's say that there's one elder among our elders who disagrees with some kind of decision that uh, is being made. Um, I served as an elder for nine years. 
when we walked out of the room, we were all in agreement. Larry, I didn't, sometimes they didn't agree with me, but I didn't walk out of the room and say, well, them guys, I tell you what, their heart is a hickory nut and they're thinking or whatever. And they didn't agree with me. I tried people to get them to see it my way, but they wouldn't do it. You can't do that. You cannot do that. Elders have all got to be on the same page when that door opens and they walk out of that room. That's very, very important, you know, for a congregation. All right, now, duties to one another. And Peter, if you would, turn to Peter real quick, and we're about to close. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, Peter says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. And as I've said, I think that's referring to the shepherds of the church. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace uh, to the humble. So we should be submissive uh, to one another. What is this about? I think it has to do with how authority is exercised and how it is received. Our Lord Jesus did a pretty good job of showing it to us, did he not, in John chapter 13? You know, he, he was the Lord, right? He was deity, and what did he do? He put on the towel of a bondservant, and he was willing to wash the disciples' feet. And so that goes into the next point about being humility. All should be clothed with humility. All of us must be clothed with humility. We've got to have lowliness of mind. And I'll leave you with this particular verse that I love. I found in Isaiah 57, 15. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and a humble uh, spirit. So show me a congregation where the elders are men of character, where they have a good reputation, where they have zeal and where they have vision, <clears throat> where these men look at the eldership um, as a work and not just some office you know, that they are to hold, where the elders encourage the members to work and to visit and where they lead themselves in good works. And guess what? I'm going to show you a congregation that's going to grow. And it's going to go, grow pretty rapidly. One of the duties of an elder is to watch for the flock. In Hebrews 13 and 17, the Bible says, Obey those who have the rule over you and submit yourselves as they who must give an account, for they watch for your souls. Here's what the elders want right here. The elders want every person in this room tonight to leave having a good relationship with the Father. That's what they want. And to have that, that means that if you're not a member of the church, you've got to confess your faith, repent, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If you have strayed away and perhaps in the good providence of God, you're here tonight. Perhaps you didn't plan to come, but you came anyway. If the elders are going to watch for your soul, you know, you've got to be a person who comes back to the flock. You've got to be that kind of person. Humble yourself. Strip away your pride. Strip away all of your arrogance and be a person of lowly mind and say, you know, I want to repent of my transgressions and I want you brethren to pray with me and pray for me. If we can help you in some way tonight, won't you let us do so as we stand and as we sing.